So now let's get into working with the conductive compounds and what it takes to dispense them. So before you order your conductive material, you need to know how about the how the materials could be stored, how it's going to show up on your shelf or onto the, uh, the doorstep here. Shelf life can be pretty varied for materials. Um, you need to know how long you'll have until the materials expire and they won't meet the, those original specs. So also some kind of compounds need to be stored in frozen or cryo conditions to slow down the curing process and prevent from hardening before it's applied, meaning you're not going to be able to ship these ground on a Friday over a holiday weekend on dry ice. <laughs> but if you did your homework and you've received your frozen material, then you would now need to be defrosted and you can either do that at room temperature or in a warm water bath to bring that temperature up at, to which they can be worked. Um, at the same time, while your compound is defrosting, the substrate may need to be prepped so that the materials adhere well for both mechanical and electrical properties. Um, some materials will need primers or adhesion promoters to prepare the surface and make sure that the compounds stick well. Um, surfaces should always be cleaned um, and oftentimes may need to be physically roughed or chemically etched so that the materials you know, adhere well. That can include sandblasting, sandpaper, or even wet sanding, as well as um, some of the chemical etching with, uh, with dilute acids. Uh, flame treating and oxidizing the surfaces, as well as conversion coatings, will help reduce a lot of that electrical contact resistance um, where the, the two materials are mated together. Um, and finally, corona surface treatments, or actually arcing of the material, will align the charged particles on the surface of a material and encourage strong adhesion, but should really only be done very shortly before the application for best results. Okay, so what about the steps to dispensing and what does good dispensing look like? All compounds and adhesives should be checked for special health and safety guidelines. You know, do you need venting in the area where you're working? And while most have pretty low volatile content or VOCs, you still may need a well-ventilated area and a proper way to dispense the material if they're hazmat classified. Um, ben, what kind of format do these materials come in? So most conductive compounds will either be one component or two component. Um, two component compounds will usually have the main binder and the curing agent separated until they're ready to use. Um, most adhesives and sealants will have a, a consistency somewhere between a pretty free flowing liquid all the way up to a thicker, grittier paste or somewhere in between. Um, you know, when you're looking at applications, vertical surfaces and overhead dispense applications will most likely need a thicker paste that does not drip or run. Um, Sierra, what do I have to know about packaging and mixing the materials? So most two-part materials, if it's not, if it's a one part, it's coming in a tube, you're going to dispense it. But most two-part materials will have to be mixed properly. And that usually happens within the package or the cartridge. So while some dispense equipment can be dispensed by hand, like a syringe, others may need equipment like an application gun or a pneumatically controlled system with a foot pump. Um, ben, are there any types of systems to avoid or steer clear of? Um, because we want to minimize the damage to the particles and protect the plating on the metal particles that give us that, that good electrical contact, um, we urge customers to stay away from auger valves or auger style systems that can actually shear the material. Good to know. So when you're dispensing, you have to know the working life of the material and how long you have to manipulate it before it starts to cure or harden. Some materials use cure systems like acetic acid cures, and they have a very short working life in the range of just five minutes. Um, others will give you more time to smooth the material onto a flange or connect the two mating surfaces together. Um, there's a few definitions to know when working with conductive compounds. One is tack-free time. And this is a term, this is the time it takes for the material to develop a skin so that it's no longer sticky or wet on the surface. And this is also referred to as a cure time to handling. And the second is full cure. When we refer to a full cure, it means the amount of time it takes to develop and complete mechanical and electrical properties as presented in the data. Um, Benner, what are the three different types of cure? So yeah, there are three different types of cure mechanism or the way in which the, the products will cure. Um, the first is known as room temperature vulcanization, and it actually involves the use of a catalyst like platinum that's combined with the binder system, um, and that facilitates the cross-linking and the, and the curing of the material. Um, the second mechanism is known as a moisture cure. Uh, this means that the material will cure as a result of the ambient humidity and moisture surrounding the material. 
Um, some things to consider are that the cure times can be impacted pretty significantly by the environment. So for example, a moisture cure system will cure much faster in the, in, in the middle of the Amazon rainforest than it will in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, the other type of cure is a heat cure system. This means that the binder will cross-link as heat is added to it. In most cases, the higher the heat, the faster the cure, um, but there are obviously upward temperature limits. Um, some materials will cure at room temperature just fine, but adding heat will actually speed up the process. Um, and a very important um, note, for heat cure materials, the highest recommended cure temperature is usually the one that will give the best mechanical properties. All right, so this slide, we wanted to describe the difference between two types of material, one a thermoset and one's a thermoplastic material. We have both types in our conductive compounds portfolio. A thermoset is a material that strengthens as it's heated, but cannot be melted or reheated after initial cure, whereas thermoplastics can be without any chemical changes. And the other definition on this slide that we wanted to touch on is glass transition temperature, um, oftentimes abbreviated as TG. Uh, glass transition temperature, not to be confused with the melting point of the material, is actually the point at which the properties of a thermoset polymer will transition from rigid and glassy to flexible and rubbery. So some materials like silicones will have a very low glass transition temperature in the you know, negative 80 um, or lower Celsius um, and are meant to be used above their glass transition temperature so they can exhibit that, those flexible properties. Others such as epoxies will have a very high glass transition temperature, meaning that at most operating temperatures, they're meant to be used in a glassy and rigid state. So after adhesives and sealants are applied, they may actually need to be painted over or sanded to match the aesthetics of the application or for aerodynamics. So usually a primer is needed before painting. And in some cases, like with silicones, um, you need an extra layer such as a poly polysulfide system to get that paint and primer to stick well to it. Airframes are a perfect example where the materials would need to be sanded down because of aerodynamics. Um, also referred to as a fairing material, that material would require sanding before final paint to make that surface smooth and free of defects.